let's see if all the technology works. So we are a bit more scattered today. So we'll do some things on the document camera. So I have to get another camera to make that work. But we'll also do yeah. some things on on the computer. Right. Um, so I think we will start on the computer because I want to get to the concept of a category today, which you might or might not have heard of. But rather than just dropping you straight into it, what I try to motivate it by a monoids, which is a theoretician's poor attempt at being practical. Right? Um, so how many of you remember what a monoid is? Did we ever tell you what a monoid was? Did Bob? Yeah, did, yeah, yeah, that's what I was hoping that Bob yeah. would have told you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so so we'll, we'll recap it now, so don't worry. But uh, I hope to show you that, I mean, I, we want, you could spend a whole course on monoids, obviously, but we're only going to spend five minutes, hopefully. Um, but I hope to show you that it's a useful abstraction for code reuse and also reasoning reuse in the sense that you can reason about just knowing there's a monoid rather than having to deep work with the specifics of a particular monoid. So what is a monoid color? Uh, you shouldn't ask such questions if you don't <laughs> want the answer. Um, uh, well, uh, uh, it's a way of combining stuff that allows you to combine any number of things, any number including zero things, two at a time. So there's got to be a way of saying, so there's a, we're, we're working over a carrier set and there's a default element which we can give back if we're combining no things. So there is an element that represents that's the upside, upside yes. Uh, and then if we're combining one thing, that had better be the thing, the result had better be the thing itself. Yeah. And if we're combining two things, then we'll need some sort of operator that turns two things into one thing. And the good news is, it's always great when you learn that there's a whole bunch of stuff you don't have to care about. The good news is, that as long as you combine two neighbors of the things that you're trying to combine into one, it doesn't matter which order you do that in. So here, if we're combining X, Y, and Z, we can kind of squish Y and Z together first and then combine X afterwards. Or we can combine X and Y together and uh, combine Z afterwards and we'll get the same answer. And that's extremely useful because uh, uh, it tells you that, for example, if you want to add up a big pile of numbers, big list of numbers, you could tear the list in half and, you know, half, yeah, each do half of it and add the answers together. And that will get you the same answer as if you start to start and compute a big running total of the whole lot. Uh, so knowing, recognizing monoid structure is, for example, very practically useful when you're figuring out how to exploit parallel processing. You know that you really can just divide up the task amongst as many cores as you've got uh, and stick the answers together afterwards. The other two rules say that uh, this epsilon thing is the right way of doing nothing for the combining operator. So if you combine with epsilon, that's just not doing anything. So you need to think lots of Lots of operations you know about, but I suspect yeah. they're on the next yeah. screen. So let's let's do one, and then yes. we we'll leave the others. Um, so I'm claiming that the natural numbers as the carrier and plus as the operation is a monoid. And my argument for this is that you all proved it in the coursework already. Yes. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, so the other thing about this sort of stuff is an example of structure. Yeah. Uh, and it begins to start kind of tidying up the actual library of stuff and also the library of stuff that lives in your head. To see that, you know, wherever we see stuff about plus, we expect to see stuff about zero. 
because le okay so let's see if we can construct a monoid so yes. this is a record right so there's a bunch of fields and to give an element of this record is to fill in all the fields right so i claim i have one of these so i'm going to say case on the result and it's telling me these are the fields you have to fill in right so you have to say what is the carrier set well i want this to be the natural numbers what is your operation? So this should go from n to n to n, right? That's going to be my plus. Okay, and then I need this epsilon, which should live in the carrier, which if I fully normalize this, says that this should be a natural number. Yeah. So a priori here I could say 17, right? Uh, <laughs> but then if I look at the identity laws, then I see that in particular I would have to show that 17 successors followed by x is the same as x, right? Which, which is not happen. very true. So uh, it's just because I asked to fully normalize it. So I may arguably I shouldn't have. So if I reload that, yeah. I just say, OK. OK, so that's, that's the useful one, right? Yes. To saying that x plus epsilon should be the same as x. So yes. 17 so, is not a very good choice for, for epsilon. What, what's, the, what's the do nothing constant <laughs> for plus? Whereas if I pick zero, then my new goal is x plus zero is x, right? Which yes. I can believe. Which is <laughs> a well-known irritation. Yeah. Um, uh, so because you've all done this in the coursework, I'm just going to use the proofs. So I think here, I said this with an implicit x. So that's the thing from the library, but explicit x. So fill that in, and then here. This way around, it it's reduces. Right. It's actually easy, but um, I used the one from the library just for the sake of it. This is a phenomenon that I characterize as uh, the way that uh, Agda turns up with arithmetic to an algebra fight. Uh, so it so happens that the left identity law uh, holds directly because of the way plus is defined by recursion on its first input. Uh, and that's a kind of arbitrary choice of how to define plus. So we get lucky. Uh, Agda's approach to algebra is utter terror. Um, it, the only kinds of equations it's willing to use are the equations that you use to define the program. It knows nothing else about algebra. Uh, so correspondingly, um, if it happens that those equations, so the, basically what's going on is that it's doing arithmetic because you explain how to compute with values. Uh, so if values show up in the right place, like a zero on the left of a plus, then fantastic, arithmetic's enough to get you home. Whereas if a free variable shows up in the way, Agda's just like, can't do anything with that. But you might have noticed that in the coursework where you were asked to prove both of these, and one was just REPL, the other one you actually had to pattern match on the X. Uh, but now I'm, I'm reusing the facts from the coursework slash the standard library. Uh, so, okay, so we have the associativity law, which said that brackets doesn't matter. So the goal is, if you put the bracket here, that should be the same as if you put the bracket here. And unhelpfully, Agda has printed this in a left associative way. So <laughs> there's invisible brackets here. Right. We can see what we have in the library, and I think we have almost the thing we want. It's just the wrong way around. So if we sim this, that you get us what we want. Okay, so we have defined a monoid, the monoid of natural numbers under addition. And like Connor said, one advantage to this is that we can now kind of forget about the particular implementation details, right? Just know that we have a monoid with plus and zero. And if we want, we could define a second monoid of booleans under and where the unit now is true and so then we have to show that true and x is x and x and true is x 
and we have to show that it doesn't matter how you bracket your hands, right? And we say that it's very similar to what happened with the natural numbers. Um, so we can define lots of different instances, and then we can define things like fold once for every monoid in one go. Can we please not call this fold? Uh, okay. Can we call it crush? We call it crush. It's called fold in Haskell, right? Which is why I call it uh, fold. Yeah, but too many things are called fold in Haskell. And that's why everyone gets confused when you call things fold. So the solution is not to call anything fold. And so Richard Bird and Lambert Mertens called this crush. OK, so the idea is that we have some monoid, and then we have a list of elements in this monoid, and we want to make one element by crushing them all together. Yeah, so this is the thing that actually says, you know, that get, gets you to the point of a monoid, which is that any number of things can be crushed together to make one thing. Yeah. Any number, including zero. So I'm going to look at the number of things I have, the x's. See that the list is either empty or non-empty. If it's empty, then I have to produce something in the carrier. I have nothing around, except I know that the carrier is a monoid. So I have the units, the epsilon of M, right? So saying if I have nothing to crush together, then I use the do nothing operation. And if I have more than one thing, then uh, backslash G, uh, Good question. Right. Big G, is it? Yeah, big backslash G for Greek. Big G for Greek and then E for epsilon. Uh, or backslash V A R Epsilon. Var yeah. epsilon. So it's a LaTeX thing. Right. Yeah. Whereas if you do just backslash epsilon, you get a slightly different epsilon. Right. Uh, okay, so if I have more than one thing, well then. I'm going to give myself access to the operation. So this is the times of M. And then here I'm going to say something times something. So I'm going to take the first element and I'm going to do that, multiply that with the result of crushing the rest of the list. Yeah. So here I'm doing a particularly stupid bracketing strategy where I'm always bracketing things to the right, but like Connor said, I could imagine splitting this list up in the middle and then doing crush on the two sublists and so on, right? And that would probably be more efficient because that can parallelize better. But um, okay, so we can do this for any monoid and then we can recover some operations we might like, such as the all predicate for Booleans, which returns true if all the elements of a list of Booleans is true or the sum function for a list of natural numbers, which sums together all of the numbers in the, in the list. Right. Uh, and the point is that we have exposed the fact that these are in some sense the same thing. Right? It's just different monoid operations, but with the same underlying idea, which now means that if you prove something about crush, for example, that crush of x's plus plus y's is the same as crush of x's times crush of y's, and that applies to both all and some, right? So we can prove things for, for at the monoid level and not worry about the details. And also, the, there's too many distracting details for the natural numbers, right? That doesn't really matter for that proof. So we could be tricked into considering the number 17 in particular, where that has nothing to do with the proof, right? So, um, anything to add? Uh, I, I guess, oh, well, just to say that this, this operation, remember we, we said, okay, it doesn't really matter what your strategy for uh, combining stuff together is. You pick any two neighbors and squish them together until there's one thing left. Uh, what that actually means is that if you've got a big computation combining loads of stuff uh, using the, the blob, uh, then uh, what matters, what determines the output is the list of the inputs rather than the tree structure of the actual calculation that you happen to do in any particular instance. Um, so that's, uh, that's the kind of, this is kind of the, the essence of, of monoid is to take 
a list of things and squish them together. So we, uh, we might and might not come back to, to more nights eventually, but well, yeah. we'll, we'll definitely come back at the end of the lecture. But, um, but for now, I the, hope we, we managed to, to convey that there is some advantage in, in identifying this structure and, yeah. and then deploying it, right? So now what I want to do is I want to talk about a different kind of structure that we can yeah. exploit in a similar can, way. Can I leave a, a, a puzzle before we leave these two monoids behind? Uh, can you think of a function from the natural numbers to the Boolean which has the property that uh, if you uh, do the function to the identity element, if you do the apply the function to zero, you get true. And if you apply the function to two numbers and then combine the results with and, you get the same answer as if you add the two numbers and apply the function. So yes, thanks, Fred. Uh, okay. Except, can you write one of the equations the other way around? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think it makes sense to swap this around. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so okay, I, I have one, one more puzzle, uh -huh. which is to think through how many monoids there are on the boolean. Oh, it's sort of like only one? Are there infinitely many? How do we think sometime about how many monoids there are with booleans as the carrier? Okay, so Maybe we'll go through the Agda code first and then we'll switch over to the, uh -huh. to the document camera. Uh, so yes, like we had a record of monoids. Now we're going to have a record of something called a category. And the reason we want to talk about this is that it's A, very useful, and B, it will also explain some of the things that you've seen in Haskell, such as functors and monads and so on. So that's, that's the goal of this section, to try to make you understand what these things actually are. Um, so we have this notion of a category, which is like a monoid, but, but more. Yes. Um, so for the monoid, we had a carrier set. So here we similarly have a set of so-called objects, but between any two objects, we have a set of homomorphisms from one object to another. And we are asking for certain things to exist, like we asked for epsilon and uh, multiplication to exist. So we're saying that for any object A, it should always be an identity morphism from A to A. And there should be a composition of morphisms. So if I have a morphism from A to B and another one from B to C, then I should be able to combine these and get one morphism from A to C. Yeah, so uh, don't be put off by the sudden arrival of Greek. Um, uh, these, it's, it's these things which behave like the carrier set in monoids. It's, it's the homs which combine with an identity and a composition. Um, so, so it's like uh, what's, what's changed is that there's a more kind of flexible notion of where you are. A, a monoid is a category that's been nailed to one spot. So. Um, right, so yes. the way we think of these things is that we have some kind of blob, which is our category C. And then this category consists of objects, which we normally draw as little dots. And we name them A, B, C, and so on. And then between any two objects, there's a set. Not the same C, by the way. Uh, right, different C, indeed. <laughs> and then 
I can ask estromorphism from A to B. And there could be one, and I could call it F, for example. And I can ask estromorphism from B to C. Well, yes, maybe there's one called G. And then at each morphism, there has to be an identity, which goes from the object to itself. And if I have a morphism from A to B and one from B to C, then there has to be a composite that goes here, right? Which you normally write as F and then G, or sometimes this is written yes. G composed F. Yes. So it's good to pronounce the semicolon then and the circle kind of composition operator that you learned in Haskell after. This is G after F, F then G. But the picture is the clearest of all. It actually shows you what's going on. Um, and of course, there can be more than one morphism between any two objects. So I can have an F prime here, and I can have an F prime prime, and so on. Yes. Um, there might be no morphisms. So in this picture, there's no morphism from B to C, right? There's something that goes this way, but it doesn't mean that something has to go the other way. And Right. Okay, and then we had some laws, just like we had laws for monoids. So again, we would like it to be the case that if I write F, then G, then the identity on C, then it doesn't matter where I put the brackets, right? So if I put it this way, that should be the same thing as if I put the brackets the other way around. So that's associativity. And again, we want the identity to act like a unit, like a do-nothing operation. So F and then identity on B should just be the same thing as F. And if I do identity on A and then I do F, that should be the same thing as just doing F. Right. So it's a lot like the monad equations but this time more typed in a way, right? Because it doesn't always make sense to smash any two things together. I can only combine things if they agree here in the middle, right? So it makes sense to combine F and G, but it doesn't make sense to combine F and F, for example, because they don't, they don't have the same. They don't meet in the middle. They don't meet in the middle. So we call this the source of F and this is the target of F. So in order to combine F and G, we need that the target of F needs to be the source of G, right? Okay, does that make some kind of sense? So at this point, you could say, okay, it's, it's just like monoids, it's algebraic structure, and it might, it might not be useful, right? Yeah. Um, but we're going to see that it's, it is useful and it, it occurs a lot. So let's see if we can go back to here. Maybe keep this. Okay, so we had this ID and comp. And then we had these laws that I talked about. So we had associativity, which says if you compose F with a composite, then you can do it the other way around. And the two identities, right? That if you compose the identity with F, you get F and then vice versa. Okay. Yeah. So, um, uh, I mean, I guess, so it's, it's good to think of uh, paths in a diagram. Uh, you know, the diagram has different points in it. There are uh, directed edges connecting the points. Uh, and the question that the, the home set tells you the set of paths between any two given points in the diagram. Uh, so, yeah, uh, that to say the things that we use to draw pictures of categories are themselves a category. Okay, yes. so let's see if we can yes. just take this picture and turn it into under. Yes. So this is something you almost never do, right? So yes. normally yes. you have some, some naturally occurring category in mind, and this one is a bit of a toy one, right? With three objects and however many more for are. But if you want to, you can do it. So I'm going to say, I have a set of objects and I have A, B and C and they are my objects. 
and I did this in a module so exactly that wouldn't happen. I didn't indent this. Okay, so now in the toy module, which means that these A, B, C are not visible outside of the module. Uh, okay, so that says I have three objects, and I want to say what my homomorphisms are. So these should go from my objects to my objects to set. Okay, and I said I had an F, which was the homomorphism from A to B. And I had a G, which was a homomorphism from B to C. And I had an FG, which was a homomorphism from A to C, right? Okay. Uh -huh. uh, so, so far, I've just defined some data, right? And I have forgotten something, which is that each object needs to have an identity, right? So I better add this in as well. ID A is so my home from A to A. ID B, ID C. And the reason I almost forgot this is that since every object needs to have it, you normally don't bother to draw it in the diagrams and so on because you know it's there, right? And you also know how it, how it works with respect to composition. It has to just return the other one. So... So normally you don't think that much about it. But here, if I want to explicitly list all of the morphisms, then I have to include them, right? Okay, so then here I can now say, this is my category. This is a category. Okay, a case in the result. And then Agda tells me all the things I have to fill in. So I have to say, what are the objects? Well, they are my objects. What are the morphisms? They are my home. Okay, and then I have to say, what are the identity morphisms? For every A1, so I need to bring that into scope, call it X. Okay, and then I can pattern match an X. So the identity on A is going to be id A, on B, id B, on C, id C. If I can give that. Okay, and then I have to say, how do I compose things? So I think I better do that in a function. So my comp says if I have x, y, z, which are objects, and I have a my home, a, b, x, x, y, x, y, and I have my home, y, z, then I should be able to go directly from x to z. Right. Yeah, you're, you've got a stray capital B in your first my object. Uh, ah. Okay. Don't call them F and G. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> right. Yeah, so okay. this will be a bit of a, a sprackle. Yeah. So now, on paper, it was quite easy to do this, right? I said, okay, the only non-trivial thing to compose are F and G, and they're going to be this one. Yeah. But of course, here in Agda, I have to be explicit about all of it. So You could do both at once, and then it will just... Yeah, maybe that's the best way. So I'm just going to pattern match on S and T. And, and it figures it, out all the things that fit together properly, which is kind of it. So it's giving me all the things that meet in the middle, right? Because the type here says that this Y has to be the same as this Y. So F composed to G, well, I want that to be FG. F composed with identity, well, that better be F, otherwise I can't prove the law later. G composed with identity better be G. This is another identity. So there's a whole bunch of identities to compose. Okay, so I just fill in what all the composites are, and then I can use this as my comp. Yeah, you could, well, there's no point in doing it. There are some optimizations, but brute yeah. force and ignorance is probably the best way. Right, so <laughs> I, I think maybe I could have, I could have had a little bit more catch here. Is that what you mean? Yes. Yeah. Uh, 
Okay, so now I have to prove associativity. So I have S T U and I need to show that if I bracket them different ways, I get the same thing. Yeah, I think brute force and ignorance is your only hope. Uh, so <coughs> I look at F, for example. Okay, and then I look at T. Yeah, it's, it's a bit it's a bit messy now because I have to look at <coughs> lots of things, right? Um, but I just look at what could these morphisms possibly be. And then in the end, I hopefully get the goal that that makes sense, right? So that's roughly. Okay, here, this is stuck because we don't know what the U yeah. is. You've got no choice. You're going to have to just enumerate all the possibilities. Yeah, right. So maybe I, I retreat. It's T U. <coughs> but then once you've actually enumerated all the possibilities, yeah. all the proofs will be by REFL, because it, it then exactly becomes arithmetic. Yeah. OK, so I'm pattern matching on S, T, and U. It's going to give me a whole wall of things. And then I can look at all of them, and they should all be simple. Right. So I could even try to do an Emacs metro. So let's say REFL, give, go to the next goal. Okay, so that all worked, right. Um, so again, it's the kind of thing you wouldn't even worry about on paper, but to ACDA you have to, to explicitly deal with all the cases, right. And at least here for the identity, I think it's not too bad. So I need to show that composing the identity with some F1. Okay, so this is F. You'll probably have to look at the object as well. Uh, well, I think if I look at the U... Oh, maybe would... that will do it, yeah. Yeah, okay, so again, I have to deal with all the cases, but they should all be raffle. Here, look at the F. So we see we can take the thing we had on paper and we can turn it into Agda, and it's a bit painful, which is why most of the time we're trying to think in our heads rather than thinking directly in Agda, right? But it's possible to do it. Um, okay, can you think of any other categories, Connor? I can think of lots of categories, but... Uh, uh, so I can think of... Uh, uh, the category whose objects are numbers and whose homomorphisms are proofs that one number is less than or equal to another number. Yeah, so, we, we'll, so there's we'll, an arrow from three to five because three is less than or equal to five. We'll, we'll get to that probably next time, I guess. Yeah. I thought maybe you could, you could try to construct the category of sets. The right? category of sets? Because this is this is where we live. This is um, uh, the kind of primary motivating example. So I don't know how much you have. <laughs> What's at the top of the file, Brad? Um, right, we have type in type. <laughs> yes. Okay. So um, uh, we're going to cheat quite badly here. Um, uh, so I've got to, the idea is uh, that uh, functions form a category where the objects are sets, and here I'm lying by saying that set is a set, but the bureaucracy that happens if I tell the truth is terrible, so we're going to suspend uh, Suspend disbelief and pretend that that set is a set. Okay, and then uh, what happens? I have to say, wh what is a homomorphism or an arrow 
from S to T. And I'm going to say it's exactly, those things are exactly the functions. Uh, oh. reload. Yeah. Uh, that's spurious yellow, isn't it? Yes, it is. Okay. So, uh, now I'm asked for um, uh, the identity function. Uh, and is that a thing called ID by any chance? Uh, no, I, no, I didn't You've, uh, okay. include it because it clashes too much with the other ID. Okay, well, I'll just do it. Yeah. Uh, do it with a lambda, maybe? I could do it with a lambda, it's true. Uh, I'm old-fashioned, so I'll do it with an actual backslash. Just like I'm drawing ASCII art arrows. So there's your identity function, gets you from one set to itself. And then I'm asked for composition. So, so I would introduce the implicit okay. functions. So, so there's an F and a G. Yeah, I think they are implicit. Are they? No, they're not. They're when we get to the laws, ah, they no, are. No, you're right. Yeah, you're right. Right. So... Um, Need to reload. Maybe I went too quick. So here... We've got a function from A to B and a function from B to C, and we want the function from A to C. So I guess I'll write that with the lambda as well, although I could just introduce the A on the left-hand side. But for uniformity with uh, the identity, it's uh, we want to do G after F. So... Uh, and then let's see if we get lucky. Um, are these two functions equal? So that's h after g after f. Uh, turns out that just by ordinary computation with lambda calculus, this equation holds exactly. What a relief. And how about identity absorption? Is uh, is lambda a f a the same thing as f? Well, in Agda it is, thank goodness. Likewise. So excellent. Um, but this is our kind of go-to example. This is um, this is the category that uh, your used to working inside when you do functional programming where the things the things that plug together using composition are functions okay how are we doing five minutes five minutes so okay uh, right. right so we have a little technical wart in the middle here so yeah <laughs> we saw here we were really lucky that ref will work as proofs of the qualities of these functions, right? But that's not always going to be the case. And because these equations are between the morphisms, which often are some kind of functions, so typically they are functions with extra properties, so function that preserves something or um, something like this, uh, then what we need is a way to prove that two functions are equal. So if I have f and g that are functions, maybe dependent functions, and I want to show that they are equal, then often it would be really convenient if I could do this by showing that they agree on all the inputs, right? So if you think of the function as some kind of mathematical function, then this is kind of when you would expect them to be equal, right? So yes. for all the inputs, you get the same output, then from the outside, these really look like the same black boxes. And there's nothing we can do to one that we can't do to the other, right? So, so in some sense, they should be equal if they agree on all the inputs. But unfortunately, you can't prove this in Agda because the only way you can prove that f is equal to g is by using Graffle, right? That's the only constructor for identity we have. And just knowing 
that we agree on all the inputs doesn't mean that they are obviously the same thing. Right. Yes, so the, the distinction is between uh, whether the functions have the same implementation versus whether they perform the same calculate or the same job, whether they get the same answers. So it's do they do do they do the same calculation versus do they get the same answers, possibly by an entirely different calculation? So you could think of F as being quick sort and G as being bubble sort, right? Then it is the case that they are going to give the same output. They're always going to produce sorted lists. But in some sense, they might not be the same function intentionally, right? Because they have different type complexity. So by not having this built into the language, we are leaving open the possibility of treating them differently. But often that's annoying. So here we are going to postulate that if they give the same outputs for the same inputs, then they are really equal, right? So we are making it impossible for us to, to distinguish between quick sort and bubble sort now, but that, that's the price we pay, right? Um, right, because, right, I guess, maybe, maybe we just pick up this tomorrow. I think there's no point in yeah. rushing um, it, but I wanted to get... This is a good place to get to. Yeah. At. So tomorrow we will pick up and we'll see that just like there is a category of sets, there is a category of monoids. So the objects are monoids and the morphism should be something that plays nicely with the monoids. Right. Um, and then we look at some more examples, but let's stop here for now. Any questions about anything? <laughs>